Is AI going to take my job? I don't think so, but it does make me more productive. And today I want to share the top three ways that I use AI to be a more productive developer. Hello and welcome. I'm Dave. Today I'm sharing three ways that I use AI to be a more productive developer. And I'll provide links to all resources in the description below. I'll also provide a link for you to join my Discord server where you can discuss web development with other students and you can ask questions that I can answer and receive help from other viewers too. I look forward to seeing you there. No starter code today. I'm just going to give examples of how AI makes me more productive as a developer. Example one, testing and code coverage. There are several AI extensions now available for VS Code. I've found that I like the Codium AI extension. Now this is not a paid promotion, although I did feature Codium AI earlier this year, and I've been using it ever since. It really excels at writing tests and identifying edge cases that I may not think of. Let me show you an example. From a recent tutorial, I've got a fetch to do's function, and this was my tutorial on async testing with React and Next.js. And you can see that it says Codium AI, test this function right above the function. So when I have that extension enabled, I can click test this function, and it brings up Codium AI over here to the right. Now I'm also going to press Control B to hide the file tree so we have a little more room. And it takes just a little bit and it evaluates this function and then it generates tests that we, it suggests. It doesn't automatically apply anything, but I can look at everything that it suggests and you can see it's generating test suites up above. It has a code explanation and code suggestions. Now this is really great for testing. So just this function as an example, this fetch to do's function where I was just getting to do's and returning them. And of course, if there was an error, instead of just letting that error bubble up, I was returning an empty array specifically in this function. But let's just look at a couple of the suggestions that it has. So if I scroll down, we can see the first test and we can pull this over even a little bit more to see everything. And it says it should return an array of to do's when fetch is successful. Here there, it's using jest and that's what it does for all these tests that it generates and it is just has a mock resolved value instead of setting up a mock API server like I did in my testing tutorial where we did async testing. However, this also works. And then we can just scroll down and see how it completes the test. And if you like that, you can go ahead and run the test. And there's other options here as well. There's run or run and auto fix. So you could ask it to change things if you want to. After that, let's look at the next test. It says returns an empty array when fetch returns an empty array. So you can also check for that. And of course, it's got other suggestions as well that we could go through. And one thing that it's really good at is checking for edge cases. So let me look up above here. We've got total behaviors 10. So if I bring that down, we can see it's got the happy path which says it's going to run these basic tests and you'd at least want to have these. Of course, handles and logs errors, it's going to suggest that I use an error logger instead of just saying console log like I would in a tutorial. Edge cases though, and I really like this because it thinks of things that I may not think of to test, just some possible edge cases where it says handles and logs errors when fetch throws an exception, returns an empty array when fetch returns null. That's one thing I wasn't necessarily checking for other tests also that are suggested. Now you can just apply what you want to, but it's very thorough and I do like that. And I wouldn't have that without this AI extension. Also the code explanation, it gives me a summary of the code and what it's supposed to do. This is also very useful when you're reading somebody else's code, which happens a lot. Remember code is read more than it is written. And of course, if you're having any difficulty understanding a function, you could just run this on it and it will give you a code explanation. And then it gives suggestions also. And I really like this feature besides just the testing and the edge cases, getting that full coverage actually that I may miss a few if I'm just thinking in my mind about testing and the basic functions that I want. I would probably miss an edge case. So I like this where it double checks, but also these suggestions now 
And we'll go through and just look at a couple of suggestions. And they have some good ones because I wrote a very simple function here for that tutorial. So when we come down, let's see what it says here. It's a suggestion. The function fetch to do should return a promise that resolves to an array of to do objects. So its return type should be explicitly defined as promise to do and why. And it gives us the uh, breakdown of the whole thing. So when we come down, we can look at this suggested code and you can see it explicitly has the promise to do there where I just let that be inferred. And that that's an okay suggestion. It's not necessary all the time. I wouldn't think so, but it is okay to explicitly say that. Let's look at the next suggestion. It should handle the case where the fetch request fails to return a valid response. So it should check if the response.okay is true. Now that's something I usually do. And clearly I didn't think to do that here before I awaited the JSON. And I would normally say if res.okay is not true, then I would throw an error right there in between. And so that's a great suggestion. So when we come down here and look at the suggested code, show full suggestion, we can see it has the if res okay or an else here as well. So they handle it maybe a little differently than I would have, but they hit that suggestion and something that I just missed that I would normally put in a function like this. So again, example of AI that I use a lot would be to evaluate my own code and evaluate code of others that I am reading as well. And then it can write these tests. And this is a great part because it thinks of things, especially those edge cases that I wouldn't normally think of. Example two, regular expressions. I've got chat GPT open now and I don't write regular expressions every day. So when I do, I often have to look everything up again. And many other devs are just like me when it comes to regex. And of course that led to other websites popping up that can help out with regex as well. And I frequently check things here with regexer.com. Regex1.com is a good site to learn more about regex as well. Again, we're talking about regular expressions. But I usually have to look those up when I want to create anything I haven't before or is a little complex. Now let's just look up a basic one here. I will say, write a regular expression to check for a valid email address. I'll press enter, it should start generating this and we'll see what we get. And here we can just click copy code as well. So what I'm going to do, it's giving me a full explanation, a breakdown of this regular expression, which is great. But what I'm going to do is copy the code and I'm going to go to regexer.com and I'm going to delete their example. I'm just going to paste in what they gave me and I'm going to select everything else they had and get rid of that as well. And I'll just type a sample email address. I'll say sample at example.com and yes, it's working. So even .co is fine. Let's see what happens if we put in two at symbols. And nope, that's not valid. Say sample dot sample. So if you had first name, last name, or something like that, it's working as I would want it to to check for an email address. That saves me a lot of time when I have to think about how to build a regex and kind of relearn things about regex when I haven't written one in a while, or it's just a little more complex. So this is a great way to save time with AI. Example three, database queries. Now I'm still in chat GPT and we're talking about SQL queries here, but you could also apply the same concept to Mongo queries, a NoSQL database or anything like that, that you just don't write that often. So it kind of comes back to code that you don't write that often. This quickly gets you up to speed and could give you what you are looking for much faster than relearning everything that you have previously known so you catch on quickly. But you also want to check this, of course. You want to check anything that you get from AI. Here, what I did was just type in an example, and I typed all of this ahead of time so we could just look at the conversation. I said you have a SQL table with two columns, just the ID and name, and the table has five records. The ID values are one through five, and here are the five names. Then I say create a SQL query that will combine all of the rows with the format ID and then value and then a semicolon, then ID and value. So I wanna take all of those rows 
and essentially just have one output, or if it was in an Excel sheet, just one cell that would have all of the values, and they would have this format, and the separator would be a semicolon. So you can see I got a response quickly that says I could use concat, and it has a group concat here. Then I realized I didn't tell it I needed this for specifically for MSSQL, a Microsoft server. So then I asked it to create the same SQL query for Microsoft SQL Server, and yes, it did, which is just a little different. That's great. Now, I have to work with, unfortunately, an old version of Microsoft SQL Server. So I had to scroll down a little bit again, and I said, I don't have support for a concat, so can you write it without concat? And yes, it did that again. That's great. But it suggested this string aggregator as well, and then I had to say, well, I don't have support for that either. Can you write it without that? And once again, it came through for me. It wrote the query as I would want to have it, essentially, without that string aggregator. But it used this stuff function to remo remove the first two characters because they're just and like an empty character and a semicolon that I wouldn't normally want here. So this is basically what I wanted, but I don't have access to this stuff function either. So at this, at this point, when I told ChatGPT, I don't have stuff either, it kind of told me, hey, tough at this point, because then it suggested a union, and then I had to base it on actually where ID equals one, ID equals two. I don't want to go through the values in my database and have all of that in a query. So I didn't want to go with this. I wanted to go with what I had up here and then just figure out another way to remove those first two characters. So let me scroll down now where I asked a couple of questions that we didn't really need at this point. And this is an actual conversation that I had just within the last week because I don't write these that often. I do know how to do them. It would take me a lot longer to remember everything that I have done in the past than it would to just have a conversation with AI like ChatGPT in this example. So here I said, is there another way to remove the first two characters from this MSSQL query result instead of using the stuff function? And then it said, yes, you can remove the first two characters of the result of your query without using the stuff function by using the substring function. And then that light bulb went off that yes, I've used substring before. Here's the query. It looks more complicated and that's because I'm using an old version of SQL Server, like from 2008. It's not my choice, it's just what I have to work with. You could inherit legacy code that's like that as well. And so what I did then, even after it suggested the substring, is I came down here and I said, is substring available in MS SQL version 10? And then ChatGPT knew that that version 10 also corresponds to SQL Server 2008 and it says, Yes, you can use it, and here is how you use it. So that helped me quickly get up to speed and get the query I needed to get some old data out of a database that I don't work with that often, but I needed to at that time. Today, I've covered the top three ways that AI helps me be more productive as a developer, and I'm sure I'm only scratching the surface. Use AI to increase your productivity? If so, let me know how you do it in the comments. I may learn something today too. Thanks, and I'll see you in the next one. Remember to keep striving for progress over perfection, and a little progress every day will go a very long way. Please give this video a like if it's helped you, and thank you for watching and subscribing. You're helping my channel grow. Have a great day, and let's write more code together very soon.